So it is again my pleasure to introduce Josh, who will be presenting um, our introduction to spectral line data analysis this morning. And Josh, uh, again, thank you very much for giving the presentation, and over to you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is my first day as a freelance lecturer. <laughs> so, um, as I'm in between jobs right now, so it's my pleasure to present this topic to you, and there is a lot of ground to cover. Um, I'll try to start with the uh, first principles, um, namely the universe, uh, because if we're talking of about spectral lines, then uh, uh, we need to know about what species we're talking about. So this is the history of the universe. Um, 300 uh, seconds uh, uh, after, or 100 uh, seconds after the, the Big Bang, nuclei form. This means that, um, that we have the elements that, that we are uh, currently seeing um, the, uh, present in the universe. And at this time, uh, basically this time, because nothing really changed a lot since then, uh, so because we haven't been very efficient in transforming the elements <clears throat> a lot. Um, this is the situation uh, that we that we even have today. Um, so there is an overabundance of hydrogen. So hydrogen, the simplest atom, uh, dominates the universe uh, with a, a contribution of 25% of helium and all the rest. Uh, we call metals, um, maybe a little bit of lithium, but the, the rest is metals. Uh, they are very uh, not, not abundant uh, very much. Um, so this is the, the universe. We have the dark energy that we don't know uh, what it is, uh, dark matter, uh, which we at least can see in galaxies uh, or in, in, in large structures, um, but with, which we also don't know what it is, and then 5% of normal metal, like me, um, where uh, most of it is hydrogen and 25% in mass helium. <clears throat> And 50% of that we have not yet seen, although uh, recent experiments have shown that these, this might be in the form of some tenuous matter between, uh, uh, between uh, along filaments uh, in the universe. I'm talking about filaments because this is basically the, the, the situation that we have at the beginning of the universe. We can see it now, uh, so we can see the echo of the Big Bang actually in the radio regime um, or infrared if, if, if you want. So, uh, so this is a picture of, the, of the, the, the most distant universe that we can see. Um, it's basically a horizon where uh, uh, light decouples from matter um, that cools uh, down th uh, through redshift. Uh, and uh, we can now see these little specks and spots, if we subtract basically uh, our, uh, the, the foreground from what we see in the distant past. Um, so and on, the, on the bottom right, you can see the structure that this, this has. Uh, there are concentrations on different angular scales. And these are sort of the seeds uh, from which the universe forms. Um, so, and then by gravitation, matter clumps and, and becomes a gross structure. And this is the structure that we are seeing today if we are doing redshift searches uh, of the universe. So uh, there is a, a global missing baryon problem um, that I've, I've been uh, talking about just now. Um, so these variants are still missing, but let's say 2.5% uh, uh, of the matter we can see. Um, and yeah, this is, this is where in parts we can see it. So the first uh, thing that, that, that we see is galaxies. And these come usually in roughly two, uh, two, two, um, uh, two types. So this is a, a random shot um, by, the, by the Hubble Space Telescope of Messier 60, 
not a, it's not a random shot. It's, it's actually a, a random coincidence of these two galaxies being close close together around the sky. One spiral galaxy uh, on the uh, top right, and in the center uh, the an elliptical galaxy. So elliptical galaxies are uh, very red galaxies. They do not form uh, many stars. And the color red is an indication that they do not form stars. Could also be an indication of uh, very young or very metal poor uh, stars or element poor stars, other element than uh, <laughs> uh, hydrogen and helium poor stars. Yes. Um, while there is the, the other type, a spiral galaxy on the uh, top right, uh, which uh, usually forms stars, and uh, the, uh, it is, they are constituted of stars. Then uh, gas, cool gas, and dust. So on, on, in this galaxy, you are also can see the dust, these, these dark, dark lanes there. So now, most of the detectable matter, 2.5% of the universe, is very hot. So it's either in stars, so you have uh, 1,000 uh, degrees Celsius or something, or, or Kelvin, um, to uh, 100 million Kelvin uh, in, in galaxy clusters. So the, the, this, this gas is detected in X-ray. These two uh, phases of the of the um, of, of of the gas that that we are seeing, or of the matter that we are seeing in the universe, is not easily uh, observable with uh, um, with line observations in, in with radio telescopes. While this stuff is so. In blue, uh, on the galaxy on the left, uh, I think it's 64, uh, 6946, NGC 6946, and that's probably wrong. Um, you see in blue, the neutral hydrogen of this galaxy's galaxy on top of the stars. And this is stuff that we indeed can see uh, with radio telescopes uh, in particular in the decim decimeter wavelength, because that, that's neutral hydrogen that we're seeing there. And uh, I'm reminding you um, that neutral, that hydrogen is the most abundant species, so it's a very important component of this galaxy, uh, of, of the universe, even if only 1% or so of all the hydrogen is neutral. But this 1% is still a lot, because there is a lot of hydrogen around. Then uh, what we can also see is uh, in the radio regime, although usually at higher uh, wavelengths, uh, is molecular gas, is the molecular gas. And that um, molecular, molecular, molecular gas is, is also some, something that, that we can see is usually colder than the, the uh, neutral hydrogen. So what you have is obviously um, mostly um, molecular hydrogen. But that is not observable. We can only see the metals that have formerly formed in stars, actually, in, uh, uh, through uh, nuclear synthesis that is taking place in stars. So that's that's what we actually able to see, what we are actually able to see um, in the radio regime if we're talking about radio lines. Um, Again, so there is a galaxy. Galaxy has contains dust, stars, and stars. Dust you can see in the infrared, and uh, stars in the optical. But there is then then there is the cool neutral gas that you see in the radio. And these are the dimensions, uh, and that gives you already a. a a taste of why we are very much interested in the in the in this gas phase. It shows a different picture of galaxy. So here you can see this is Andromeda, the uh, nearest um, large neighbor of the Milky Way of our, our our own stellar system. That's much larger if you observe the cool gas. So it shows a different a different 
uh, phase you can trace whatever, uh, for example, gravitational potential at much larger radii. And this is the line basics. I do not want to. <clears throat> I do not want to bother you too much for this. I mean, uh, one hour is not certainly, or forty-five minutes, not enough to to really go through this in uh, in, in in the very detail. So on the here, what you can see here is basically the um, the 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 most simple form of radiation transport, where you have an uh, absorption coefficient. So if, if your matter goes through a, a layer of, or if your light goes through a layer of um, of intervening material, that that light will be absorbed. So it will will be dimmed basically, or radiation will be dimmed, and that's that's the absorption coefficient kappa. But it will also emit uh, spontaneously or on on its own, and that's the emission coefficient. coefficient uh, epsilon here. So you have a you have a if you have line emission, then you have a line profile. That's that's phi of nu, nu and you can pretty much uh, calculate using the so-called Einstein co coefficient what the radiation will look like that uh, that you see after the 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 uh, radiation has passed through this layer. And in the, the in the, in the state of the so-called local thermal equilibrium, so we, we assume that, that everything is relaxed uh, in a in a certain volume. Uh, then uh, we have a we have a very well determined um, uh, emission, um, uh, well, very well determined emission uh, coming from that uh, that region. So there are several processes uh, that we know of that that line emission, which is transition from one energy level, a discrete uh, transition from one energy level in atoms or molecules uh, to another, um, which the first of which is a spontaneous emission, uh, where after a certain time, um, a certain set of uh, species of, of one particles of one species emits a, a certain number of photons. That's the spontaneous emission. Induced emission is if you send light into a medium and that triggers basically the emission of another photon. So it, it, uh, it triggers the transition, a transition from one level, from energy level to another. And, uh, and the, the result would be an induced emission while the other is an, an absorption, you send a photon to, to an atom and uh, it absorbs the photon and changes the energy level. This is, these are the basics, simple. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can derive many, many formula. Um, uh, and you probably did that in your courses or do it, will do it uh, in, the, in the future. But let's go back to uh, the the more higher level uh, um, um, uh, higher level uh, picture. So, what type of li line radiations line radiation do we have? There's recombination lines, molecular lines, molecular lines. I, I, I talked about that uh, in uh, if there is an if there are molecules, they have rotational uh, energy levels, they are discrete or uh, vibrational, and these are uh, these are also uh, discrete uh, transitions between the the, the two levels. Um, Hyperfine lines uh, are. Um, transitions that stem from the coupling of. Um, of the total spin of an electron with the total spin of the nucleus. And the most prominent is the neutral hydrogen line. We just uh, um, discussed the radio recombination lines because my emphasis will be the, the, the H1. So radio recombination lines are, uh, if you have an ionized medium, then uh, uh, 
electrons will be captured by uh, um, by by the by the nuclei at, at, at some 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 or by ions, uh, positively charged ions, and then they are in a very excited state, and then they will cascade down um, to their ground state. At the very high energy levels, the differences between the energy levels aren't that big, so these can emit very very small amounts of energy, and this will be then seen in the ray. Um, so what we are tracing here is star for, for example, star forming re regions uh, that uh, that emit radio recombination lines. You have many many species uh, of these because you have many metals that can can do can emit radio recombination lines. So one thing about this is they, they are very the, the natural line width is very narrow, so that such that in uh, uh, usually radio recombination as the width of the line can be used to uh, to trace the temperature of uh, of such um, ionized regions. Um, in terms of of molecular lines, uh, there are. Rotational modes uh, usually seen in the in the in, in the radium, and uh, the, there is also uh, masers. Uh, so if you have if you have an electron that that gets pumped from the ground state to a, a, a higher state and can then cascade down or can can then drop down um, <clears throat> in uh, to to a lower state, then you have the, the natural condition for a, a maser. They are uh, visible in L-band, in, in Mercat. Um, so most prominent OH, 1665 megahertz, 1667 uh, megahertz. Also tracing uh, well, um, um, regions, molecular regions within, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, vicinity of, of hot uh, uh, gas. Um, Below there is shown uh, another example of uh, cold gas, cool, very cool gas. So this is uh, um, carbon monoxide in a very distant uh, galaxy, spider web galaxy. Um, this is another species, so we can trace very cold gas using molecular lines. Um, usually uh, the CO line is at 110 um, gigahertz, so it's not visible by Mercat, but if you, sh if, if it is, if it gets redshifted enough, so the, the Hubble shift of, of the line is, uh, is uh, strong enough, it can be seen with the uh, VLA. So th it gets into the DC meter regime, um, but I mean, this is basically uh, usually the, the domain of ALMA. Uh, so millimeter and submillimeter uh, uh, astronomy, and then there is this uh, neutral hydrogen to the right. You see the a galaxy, and to the left you see uh, or a galaxy group actually pretty harmless, nothing happening there. And then you see the uh, the the reality to the left. This has been realized, so I say in the 90s that there is something going on. In this system, and indeed, it's a it's a highly interactive system. I think, meanwhile, also observed in stars, but first observed in the neutral hydrogen component uh, that shows that these galaxies are these galaxies are all connected in a, in a in a very vast interaction. Neutral hydrogen is a fine uh, uh, hyperfine line, which means that uh, so this is the simple picture. A uh, neutral uh, hydrogen atom em emits a small unit of radio emission. And this happens if the spin of the proton and the electron uh, flip, flip from uh, rotation in the same uh, sense to rotation or spinning in, in, in the opposite sense. To photon emitted. Um, now the Advantage of this is, or any line, is that uh, you can make use of the Doppler effect. So the line, the color of the line, the frequency of the line gets redshifted depending on the uh, the radial motion with respect to us. 
it uh, becomes uh, redder uh, if it goes away from us, or redder in, uh, in, 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 in this case, meaning the, uh, the frequency goes down. And it becomes uh, um, uh, bluer if, if a, a source comes towards us. In other words, the frequency gets uh, increased. This is how it looks like uh, in, uh, in more, more physical terms. Um, there's the, the, uh, the neutral hydrogen is able to do a hyperfine transition in the ground state uh, with an orbital quantum, quantum number of zero. The electron spin is, an, is a half. Uh, the electron angular momentum quantum number is also a half. Um, then the nuclear spin or quantum number, since it's only one proton, is also a half, such that the nuclear spin is also a half, so, such that the coupling, the total spin quantum number can be one or zero. And that transition uh, gives you a, um, a line of uh, 1420.4057517867 megahertz. And it's really known to that precision. Uh, well, uh, this is approximately 21.1 centimeters. So this is the famous 21 centimeter line, if you've heard that. Uh, now, the Einstein coefficient, uh, so the probability of, uh, of this transition is very low, uh, which gives a, a half time of 1.11 times 10 to the seventh years. Um, so if you have a, a set of uh, um, hydrogen atoms in an excited state, uh, then it takes uh, 10, 10 to the seventh years until half of them have made this spin flip. And that's a very long time. So the probability is, is low, which actually um, is the cause for the very sharp uh, natural line width of this line that I gave uh, above. And the reason why we're nevertheless seeing H1 is because there are so much of it. Yeah, galaxies contain uh, 10 to the ninth uh, solar masses, or well, some of them contain 10 to the ninth solar masses, let's say 10 to the fifth, 10 to the, to 10 to the 11th solar masses uh, of neutral hydrogen. So there is a lot, we can see it. And uh, using uh, the, the known properties of uh, neutral hydrogen, we can uh, determine uh, the, the column density uh, or the, the column density, so the integrated density uh, along the line of sight pretty easily, uh, and uh, also the, um, the, the redshift or the, the radial velocity of the material that we are seeing using, uh, yeah, using the redshift. So this leads me to the first application. So we are talking about tools here, and this is a tool to analyze galaxies. So we were using uh, the neutral hydrogen to analyze galaxies. I, I showed you that there is a lot of gas, a lot of uh, neutral hydrogen in a galaxy. And uh, what happens is that the gas rotates in these disk galaxies about the center of the galaxies. And then what we can do is determine a so-called uh, uh, rotation velocity. We can determine the rotational speed of that galaxy. I, uh, I'll come to that uh, later. Um, and by doing so, um, we can uh, determine the gravitational potential. But first, what has this to do with us? So this is a radio course. And uh, so why line observations and how do we generate a line observation? Or how, how do we get to these images? So, so the first thing is uh, you have already gone uh, so far, I guess that uh, you now know the measurement equation. It's the visibility, or uh, this is the baby measurement equation. 
uh, visibility is a function of uh, uh, UV coordinates and in the visibility domain, so-called visibility domain and frequency, which transforms by, by a Fourier transform to the intensity on the sky. Uh, lots to be done about that, but that's, that's the course, uh, that's what the course is about. Now, new is the frequency, and, and this is it. Uh, you have also learned that in principle you are not uh, transforming the, the sharp visibility and the intensity, but this is always in an average quantity, averaged over a, uh, over a channel, at least, over some uh, uh, frequency interval. So they are a fu function of frequency and uh, they are always measured over a frequency interval, they are a Fourier pair, so no, nothing uh, mysterious about that. Although I ever always wonder how Fourier came up with that stuff. Anyway, um, and this is the division. If you have a large frequency interval, then you're doing continuum signs. And if you choose your frequency intervals small enough, then you're doing line signs because you can resolve the lines. That's all that there is to it. So Meerkat comes with 32K channels uh, in, in some modes. And if you take in that mode, uh, L band, uh, if you take a channel there, you have a velocity resolution of five kilo kilometer per, se per second in H1. That means you're doing line signs. If you are not Fourier transforming, or if you don't image uh, several channels in, in one go, but channel by channel. That's lines, line signs. Now, that there is something about the terminology. If you have multiple images of this type stacked together, frequency, or, I mean, frequency by frequency channel, then you have a data cube. Of course, it's a three dimensional uh, uh, entity. This is a cube, um, and um, yeah, here you can see this has uh, uh, three dimensions. One is right ascension, one is declination, and the other one is velocity or uh, uh, wavelength, uh, if, uh, as, I, as I wrote it down, or in other words, frequency. So uh, on the left, you can see this galaxy from the top. So that's right ascension declination. And then I turned the whole thing to the right. Um, and there you can see the same galaxy uh, projected in, um, uh, in velocity. So that's, that's how the galaxy looks like in velocity. So it's a 3D cube in a six dimensional phase space. So usually we're used to uh, three dimensional entities like this cup or so in a six dimensional phase space because we cannot visualize how fast it is going. Um, or this one. But in this case, uh, it, is, it is two spatial dimensions and one velocity. That's what, uh, what we have to um, uh, think about. And this, is, this visual, visual, visualization is the first tool that we have to, uh, have, have, have to address when we're talking about line analysis. Uh, what can we do with this? So uh, on the right, show, I'm showing the cube of the same galaxy, UDCA 105, very nice, very nice galaxy. And on the top, you can see how the velocity of this galaxy changes. I hope that, that this is visible. Um, the first thing is at different positions, you can, uh, you can generate spectrum, and that is uh, shown on the left. So these spectra can be analyzed is, uh, in terms of uh, what velocity has the material at that, uh, at that position and also um, what, is, what is the line shape? Do we see more lines than one? Uh, do we see a supernova explosion? Then you would see shells uh, so that you could see interpreting those uh, spectra. The other um, the other quantity that you uh, want to derive is shown on the right. Um, so this is the galaxy integrated along the velocity axis. So just showing the so-called total 
intensity. Total intensity is basically a measure, is, is, is also uh, is convertible into column density if the material is optically thin very easily. Uh, not so easy if it's, if it's uh, optically thicker. Um, and this is called uh, a moment zero. Um, you see the formula on the, on the uh, upper left there. Um, second thing is uh, we're interested in velocities. And uh, then we, have, we can derive the so-called first moment, um, which leads to a, a so-called velocity map or a moment one map. This is the intensity weighted in, uh, sorry, the intensity weighted velocity. And there you see the typical picture that a galaxy has. If you think about it, and maybe I will uh, demonstrate this a little bit better later, think about it. You have, uh, this is the typical pattern of a rotation in a galaxy. You see the green line there? Um, this can be used to uh, derive spectra along this line. So this is also a, a very common tool to have a, an inspection of a galaxy. Um, on the left, you see for each position on this line, um, uh, a spectrum in the, in, the, in the y direction. So this is basically an, an advanced, uh, an advanced 2D picture of many spectra in one go. Um, So-called position velocity diagram. Uh, and if you're if you have the eye for it or the training, you can already see that there are some some things that uh, that indicate certain uh, physical processes that uh, that happen in this galaxy. For example, here. I don't know if you can see the curves and what's not are there. There is something sticking out, which uh, which indicates to me that there is some extra planar gas or some some extra gas probably uh, going shooting up vertical to the disk of this galaxy. So a uh, little bit of physics uh, because I wanted to discuss uh, rotation uh, uh, curves uh, with you. So galaxies are 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 disky. Artists, why is this? So if you have an entity, gas, a gas cloud that rotates a little bit, has angular momentum, that collapses, or that that that, that gas cloud can collapse because the atoms, they can, the rent motion can go away because that radiates away, the energy can get can radiate away. But what that thing cannot radiate away is angular momentum. And the best way to keep the angular momentum be, is become disk on, and become a disk with circular orbits. Circular orbits are simply the, the highest angular momentum is sim simply maintaining the highest angular momentum with the least amount of energy that you can have. So if you cannot lose angular momentum by en energy, you will end up in a, in a, in a um, uh, in a circular orbit. Um, of course, not all galaxies are relaxed. I showed you the uh, MA182 system before. Uh, so, but but this is uh, this is if we are seeing this, we can observe galaxy evolution in action. Actually. Now, I told you that. So, if you are looking at a galaxy disk and you have this rotation, rota uh, gas rotating, depending on the position of the uh, um, position in the galaxy, you see a certain re recession velocity. You can uh, you can make this all relative to the total recession velocity of the galaxy, and then you see a picture like like to the right. That's, that's the velocity field. And that you can derive by uh, uh, taking uh, the, the peak position, and you can get as complicated as you want deriving uh, uh, velocity fields, proper velocity fields. There is a whole machinery and a lot of discussion about how you do this properly. 
uh, then you, you get, get your uh, velocity field. Once you have that, and you can you do have a complication, so it's not all uh, galaxies are coplanar. So still they are on, uh, still they, their materials on circular orbits, but they can be warped. This is very very nicely seen in this picture of NGC 5055. So uh, this led to the um, to the construction of the or to the invention of the tilted ring model. It's a purely kinematical model of a galaxy where you uh, imagine or where you, where you say, okay, all the gas is on circular orbits, but it may be tilted with respect to the central plane. And this means that you parameterize uh, a galaxy by two orientation parameters, central position, the surface brightness profile, and the rotation velocity. Um, Terrific is, is one of the, uh, the softwares that can be used to do this using the data cube. There's others, but this is a whole complete new lecture uh, uh, that I, I would need, need to give. So you can do this in two ways. You can analyze the data cube itself, or you can analyze the velocity field. Both approaches have their advantages and disadvantages, of, although in recent times, more and more people are using the, uh, the cube method. And then you can go as complicated as you want in terms of expanding the tilted ring model to um, to derive or to 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 get uh, more complicated or more complex structures that you parameterize in a galaxy. I will show you in a moment. So the thing is, the gas doesn't move as expected. So. Uh, this was a very strong, or this was where uh, dark matter in galaxy got finally established. See, if you if you take a rotation curve that is, and please look at the bottom right uh, picture, if you take rotation curve that you expect the shape, and it's the shape, if you, that you expect uh, looking at the light distribution, then you would get uh, something like this, uh, dashed curve here. But the sh you could scale this up and down by saying, okay, the stars are weighing more or less, so that we, we, we do not estimate the, the mass correctly from the light. But what you cannot do easily, unless you really have a very tweaked picture of a galaxy, produce a rising or a flat rotation curve from this uh, distribution of the stellar light. And this formula using modif modified Bessel functions had, or has already been found in the 1970s for an exponential disk. Um, it's just to demonstrate that people were thinking about this for a long time, but only, uh, let's say, uh, in the 80s, it was Bosma, this guy uh, that I, show, I showed there, Albert Bosma. Very, uh, very nice astrophysicist. Uh, Bosma uh, showed that in external galaxies there is this uh, this extra component which is most com most which is not compatible with uh, with baryonic matter basically. So this was the the proof that um, that dark matter would exist in uh, in other stellar systems. Um, in the optical, it wasn't that possible at all, or what was not easily possible, because that was tied to the stars, to the to the star formation, or star forming regions, so to the massive where 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 the baryonic matter dominates in galaxies. So only the H1, which was much more extended, uh, was was uh, the tracer that could be used to prove the, uh, the, the extended, or the proof the existence of dark matter in galaxies. Nowadays, uh, we're able to, uh, to do more sophisticated models. So in this experiment, what we did is uh, we showed that this galaxy has, a, has probably um, um, a spiral structure seen from edge on. So if you, if you 
if you take into account that this galaxy is only seen edge on, then this is this is quite an achievement to show that this uh, from the kinematics just by modeling that a galaxy looks like this. And it has physical implications that I cannot discuss here. Now let's come to the fun stuff. Uh, so nowadays, with the wide field of um, of Meerkat, um, we can see a lot more. So this is uh, an observation of uh, Fornax A, uh, where it could be shown that missing gas is uh, is is floating around in, uh, in in Fornax, which was much more than expected before. So these are the, this is the type of experiment that you're looking at these days. Yeah. Um, Meerkat has a very wide field of view, it's very sensitive, so you can look far further and have much larger or can, can image much larger structures on the sky. And all, this, all these clouds are H1 in a, in a galaxy cluster. Of course, you can do the classical stuff. Um, in a sense, uh, this is a, 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 a starburst um, galaxy in which uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Janja Mazin Manana, uh, showed or is showing that there is a lot of, of gas probably outflowing from this galaxy using uh, this velocity field. Uh, you can see it to the right. It's irregular to the bottom right, uh, showing that there is something, some, some likely outflowing gas from this galaxy uh, produced by the starburst. Um, then, uh, as I said, there are large uh, groups also, or large entities, and this is this is showing NGC 7232 um, um, investigated by my colleague uh, uh, Dr. Namumba. Um, so, what we see with the increasing sensitivity now is, is more and more intergalactic gas. So we're seeing the, uh, the results of interactions of this galaxy and the fate of this gas will basically determine what happens to the galaxies, how the galaxies will evolve in these galaxy groups and in the future. Uh, this is a blow up of this region which hasn't been uh, seen in this, 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 this large um, um, so this this large an envelope of, of gas hasn't been seen before in this uh, this galaxy group. Finally, there are more and more larger and larger uh, uh, structures. This is an example of a of a sixteen hour um, observation uh, with Merkab of a filament of a galaxy filament. So in this case, what you're doing is you're combining. Uh, your line observations uh, in, into a mosaic, and that's shown on the right. And I don't know if you can see this; these little bright spots popping up. These are all galaxies. And uh, to the left, I show uh, 150 of the brightest sources along this filament. What you can study there is the galaxy evolution along these filaments. And this is what modern telescopes will give you. Now, um, this is a uh, this is the same. Same observation. Um, so, with the larger and larger cubes, what we also need to do is uh, uh, make use of visualization tools. And uh, IDVV is uh, as developed in, uh, in, in in Cape Town is one of the examples of how to actually vis visualize and analyze um, such uh, large. Uh, volumes and what is shown here is basically a walk through through that filament that I've, I've shown you and uh, to the cube that we can see from different angles and uh, and then uh, interpret the results. Um, so visualization tools uh, are important. There are a few. Um, I wanted to, to, to mention this one. Um, good old karma that I have uh, have been using throughout this uh, presentation quite a lot, was developed in, uh, in the 90s. So uh, it's pretty much a very crazy application that, uh, 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 that lasted really, really uh, 20, 30 years. 
until it probably will now be uh, uh, replaced. If you have such large volumes, what you need to do is source finding. Um, there are many source finders, so you cannot go galaxy by galaxy unless you have very, I mean, you have time and you are searching for really uh, uh, special things in your data queue. But what you want to do is, or what you need to do, uh, if you have thousands of galaxies in very large services, you need to do an automated source finding. And actually, at the end, also automated uh, uh, analysis um, <clears throat> of, uh, of the detection that, that you have. Now, <clears throat> there's software to do that. Um, Sophia is, is one example. It makes use of an, of an old technique. Um, or the, the main mode of Sophia source finding algorithm, I think, is, uh, is to filter the cube in all dimensions and you convolve uh, a cube in, in all dimensions and clip and declare everything about the threshold of potential source. And then the spice here is that uh, posterior you uh, you can use a prob probability distribution uh, in in uh, in uh, in the space of some source properties to um, to determine how high the probability for one or the other source is. Once you've done that, you can actually filter out your galaxies in your survey and determine the velocity structure of the survey as shown here. And obviously identify interesting sources, like the one to the right, which is a, a highly warped galaxy. Finally, there's absorption lines um, that I, uh, I, I still need to mention. So line observations is not only uh, an emission line that I have discussed in, in, in some, some detail here, but you can also uh, use absorption lines. If you have a very bright background object, then the light will get dimmed uh, by, by, by the foreground gas that, that you're seeing. And with that, uh, you, you have the chance uh, to see in absorption what you're, what you're not able necessarily, uh, uh, necessarily uh, in, um, in emission, especially since this is redshift independent. So if you have an intervening, so an intervening cloud uh, in front of a source, this can have a very high redshift and the physics and the, 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 um, the absorption will still be as strong um, approximately. So this is not in, entirely true. But uh, you can go to much higher redshift if you're, if you're using absorption. So MALS, for example, is an absorption line survey with uh, Meerkat uh, and with, uh, with, with a goal to study absorption lines in, a, in an abundance that, uh, that we have, um, um, haven't had before yet. One advantage, and uh, this is basically the last application, the last analysis uh, tool, uh, that I present uh, in, in, in the context of, of line uh, science is um, you can uh, determine the time evolution of natural constants. So different lines in different species uh, de depend on different uh, uh, natural constants like the, the fine structure uh, constant in a different way. And if both lines are affected, so, so you have different, different species um, or different, even different transitions um, in, a, in, a, in an atom. So if both lines are affected or if both lines are affected the same way by, uh, uh, in, by, by redshift, so they, they have here, they have, a, a separation of this 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 many uh, megahertz. So if there is an evolution in the natural constants, then this there might be slight differences in in those lines because they dip, uh, depend differently on this on this uh, natural constants. 
It's a very uh, exciting application of absorption lines, absorption line physics, because you can see again uh, very far into the uh, into the past or into the distance. So this is uh, what I want you to take uh, away here. Uh, <laughs> as soon as your channel width becomes small enough, you are doing line signs. Yeah, that's that's it. Image one channel, image channel by channel, then you have a line. You're doing line signs. They are uh, in the decimeter wavelength range, which is Meerkat. Uh, is uh, there are radio recombination lines, molecular lines, molecular lines in form mostly of masers uh, and neutral hydrogen. Uh, there are absorption lines that you can observe. Um, the first analysis steps are the uh, extraction of data cubes or stacked images. Then you can do spectra. From there, you can do the moment maps, so the total intensity map or the velocity field. I haven't discussed the dispersion. Uh, position velocity diagrams are uh, uh, the stacked uh, spectra or along a line. Then uh, the most common application of a higher level analysis of rotating disks is a tilt ring model, uh, with which you can uh, uh, examine the uh, dark matter structure of galaxies or the, the, the gravitational structure of galaxies, but also gas physics if you contrast and if you expand the tilt ring model. Finally, these days, large data cubes require an automated source finding and analysis. Uh, uh, um, of, of, of data cubes. And with that, I hope I have given you a nice introduction, or more or less nice introduction to what you can do in terms of line analysis uh, with radio data uh, as provided by interferometers like Mirkan. Thank you.